right. Greetings, my fellow stream loves the sovereign thinkers. This is LL3's newest podcast. My name is Craig, transmitting from the beautiful land of enchantment, which is also known as New Mexico. And today's date is Sunday, October 23rd, 2016. Yes, out and about within Rio Rancho, which is northwest of Albuquerque to be exact. And a nice, another cool evening. And it'll be Sunday on the East Coast, so hopefully I was out there doing well. Even though this is just being recorded, is that live? Oh, wrong answer. <laughs> oh, why not? It's going to have fun anyway. Yeah, so it's like more goodies coming out with the whole geopolitical perspective. And um, you know how that goes, song and dance. But you never know. One thing I'm happy about, people are seeing the bigger picture. And um, you never know, my friends, it can all backfire on those demoniacs, I would say. Yeah, so I'm not going to do enough ranting. I was going to make it a little sweet. However, I'll be mostly talking about some of these topics. And we all, a lot of us know and may not know, um, Weekly Director Gavin McFadden has passed away. And there, um, I'll be talk- doing a couple of... Uh, Articles on him, and this one here came from the Inquisitor.com. It's entitled WikiLeaks Director Gavin McFadden Has Died. Publications Post Tribute is because breaking, but I just found this out earlier this morning. It says here WikiLeaks Director and Founder of Center for Investigative Journalism Gavin McFadden has died. WikiLeaks confirmed their official Twitter account that the journalist has passed by, posting a tribute to the man that he's now. That they say is now taking his fist in his fight to battle God. The publication announced the death of our of the beloved director by posting a photo and tribute to their Twitter account. The message was signed by J. A. indicating that it came directly from WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange. However, it is currently unknown at this time how Assange gained internet access as he recently had his access cut by the Ecuadorian embassy over potential election interference charges. Weekly has also posted a statement from McFadden's wife, Susan Ben, to the social media account. The statement was published on McFadden Center for Investigative Journalism, which I have that on link to, and noted that the late husband was a fierce defender of justice and human rights around the world. Susan notes that Gavin was a, was a strong force behind the changing journalism landscape that he was committed to ethical yet hard-hitting reporting. His commitment to exposing the true nature of power was his life force. He spearheaded the creation of journalistic landscape, which was irrevocably lifted the bar of, for ethical and hard-hitting reporting. Gavin worked tirelessly to hold power to account. He once said, good journalism is always political journalism. Susan went on detail her husband's long history before founding TCIJ, noting that he has always been committed to investigative journalism. He, she called his body of work in the investigative field unparalleled, revealing that he had been banned from apartheid South Africa. The Soviet Union was attacked by neo-Nazis for his investigative films. Gavin was one of the life's bravest, most passionate and courageous souls. Prior to CIJ as an investigative journalist, Gavin produced as directed more than 50 investigative documentaries, many for Grand Granada Television World in Action. They cover countries as diverse as Britain, Nicaragua, Ecuador, Guyana, South Africa, Mexico, Hong Kong, Thailand, the U.S., Sweden, India, and Turkey. He was banned from apartheid South Africa, the Soviet Union, and attacked by British neo-Nazis because of his films. The volume and quality of his body work is unparalleled. WikiLeaks noted that Gavin, Gavin McFadden was a mentor to Julian Assange and that he also mentored many other WikiLeaks journalists. TCIJ also put a tribute to McFadden, noting that they were extremely sad to announce their founder's death. Other tributes to the pioneering journalists have poured in on Twitter, including one of the hacktivist organization Anonymous. The cause of death has not been released. However, in the original post from wife Susan, the statement indicated he passed away from a short illness. The line about the short illness was removed and no further word has been given on an exact cause of death. 
However, Posteen indicates that he had may have been ill in days leading up to his death. Some one thing I gotta say in this the man did made impact. And that's what honorable journalism is. That's people I support and, and always pay homage to. I want the real deal. Nothing fabricated, nothing directed from a script, but from the heart and soul. And so far, a lot of us, as I said, I just found this out this morning. And a little bit, very morose, to be exact. But the man made a huge impact. Especially dropping these info bombs, I would say. Or WikiLeaks, whatever you want to call it. On the, the elections. It is unbelievable. However, I'm going to continue on. On Gavin McFadden. This is from the TCIJ, which is the Center for Investigative, Investigative Journalism.org. On Gavin McFadden. And he died, of course, this came out the 22nd of October, 1836. So they say 6.30, looks like possibly Britain time. I'm not so sure. Yeah, London time. We're extremely sad to announce the death of Gavin McFadden, CIJ's founder, director, and its lighting. Light. Gavin died of lung cancer surrounded by loved ones in in London on Saturday, September 22nd, October, 22nd of October 2016. Over his lifetime, Gavin was a fierce defender of justice and human rights around the world. He was warm, caring, large in life person. As many will attest, endangered love and respect from all who met him. His life and now he lived it completely in sync with the principles that he had held dear and practiced as a journalist and educator to conform to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Gavin found the Center for Investigative Journalism in 2003 to address the worsening media climate for in-depth uh, skeptical and ad adversarial reporting. Over the next 13 years, he helped train thousands of reporters from over 35 countries, many of which are places where journalism is under attack and those who speak out are at enormous risk. His students have gone on to great things in their careers and can point to Gavin as a mentor and inspiration. He has touched countless lives. His steadfast support for whistleblowers and journalists working in difficult environments has saved and given succor to some of the globe's most threatened individuals and groups. He was a model of what journalists should be. Gavin was one of the life's bravest, most passionate and courageous souls. Prior to CIJ, as an investigative journalist, Gavin produced and directed more than 50 investigative documentaries, many from Granada Television's World in Action. They cover countries as diverse as Britain, Nicaragua, Ecuador, Guyana, South Africa, Mexico, Hong Kong, Thailand, the U.S., Sweden, India, and Turkey. He was banned from apartheid, South Africa, the Soviet Union, and attacked by British neo-Nazis because of his films. The volume and quality of his body work is unparalleled. I know I'll repeat, it sounds, sounds like I'm repeating, but technically I'm not, so bear with me, folks. His loyalty to those under attack from powerful fo forces, particularly with the most journalistic groups like WikiLeaks, will remain a beacon for years to come. His commitment to exposing the true nature of power was his life force. He spearheaded the creation of journalistic landscape, which has irrevocably lifted the bar for ethical and hard-hitting reporting. Gavin worked tirelessly to hold power to account. He once said, good journalism is always political journalism. We want to catalog all the memories and stories that people have here have about Gavin on our website. Please email gavintributes at tcij.org with your thoughts, stories, and sedotes, photos, videos, interviews, and anything else about Gavin that you want to share. Help us celebrate his wonderful, unique, and inspirational human being. On behalf of our family and many friends, Susan Ben, the board and staff of CIJ. And like I said before, that's the kind of people I always admire. Not these big fancy superstars or celebrities, Hollywood celebrities. I'm not saying they're bad folks, but that's not intriguing. People risk. 
take um do what's really right. And athletes, you can say I'm not gonna back criticize them completely because on the who they on the, maybe on the, on the upper part, yeah. But as them as rank and file, they do perform and they get banged up and all that too. So I'm not gonna condemn them at all. But when I look about Gavin McFadden and anyone else, is doing giving people the truth. That's why I want to do a show like this, I like to give you my views and good faith. I'm not here to write a key script and someone tell me what to do. Look, I'm just, I'm my own person. I'm a, that's why I call me, I'm a rat tag maverick. But on the other hand, what he did and all the people that, that um, were inspired by him, look what's happening now. We know about the war in journalism is effective world, is affecting everyone worldwide. Doesn't matter where you at. Everyone, they're a big target. And then if you hear my past shows, you know, you understand because I've done, I've I addressed this a good amount of times. You got to keep the fire going. Don't extinguish it by any means. Doesn't matter what you do, folks. We all have obligations and duties. We see tyranny going. It's happening everywhere, regardless what country you're in. It's affecting the world. And that's what the One World Order is about. And they can they despise individuals like him. And anyone has the courage and the guts to stick their neck out to give everyone out there authentic information, which is the truth. And I'd like to say this to McFadden, Gavin McFadden. Thank you for what you achieved. You have made an enormous impact on everyone's lives. For integrity and principle. May your soul be forever free. I know in the spirit world you'll be button heads with with the dark side, with the truth. And what did George Carlin say? The truth was shut, set you free and pissed off your pissed off your enemies. You know what? I like that. And that's all I'm gonna talk about on Gavin McFadden. Because I never really met the man, but um a lot of people, I know a lot of people follow WikiLeaks clue myself on Twitter. And look what's happening. So I'm going to be, and I like it. It's an exciting time to be alive, my friends. Next one here came from Free Thought Project, which they did their site through Activist Post. And this one's entitled, Army Major Says Everything's in Place to Round Up Anti-War Dissenters for Military Detention. This is by Justin Garner. It says here, while mainstream media has ditifully echoed the U.S. government narrative that Russia is to blame for increasing tensions, we at the Free Thought Project have reported on numerous ways in which the U.S. has actually been the provocateur. Earlier in 2016, the U.S. military officials said the U.S. needs and wants Russia as an enemy. There's links for this, folks. You can see it for yourselves because you know me. I always put my footnotes in here so you guys can really look into it, okay, on these articles which was followed by a litany of falsehoods about, about Russia's threat from elected and appointed officials. Hacked email showed NATO general plotting conflict with Russia as American and NATO military forces amass along Russia's borders. U.S. intervention in Syria has provided the perfect context for escalating tensions in its efforts to top... Ooh, sorry about that. Had a little hiccup there. It is an effort to topple the Assad government, the U.S., nurtured the Salafist fundamentalist sect in Syria, which went on to become a major part of ISIS as U.S. military operations get dangerously close to Syrian and Russian forces invited by their Assad, and any accidental strike could be the spark for World War III. If, there were not, if this were not disturbing enough, the reality in the homeland is downright frightening. Since 9-11, the U.S. military surveillance state has been able to use and perpetuate, perpetuate the specter of terrorism to dismantle the rights of citizens. In other words, the road to tyranny, a 24-7 excuse for everything. In order to sustain public support for its war making, the state must suppress the dissent. The dissent, dissent. If, cannot, if it cannot achieve through media control and other subtle means, it is prepared to take more forceful measures. According to retired 
Army Major Todd Price, the U.S. government has everything in place to round up anti-war dissenters and put them in military detention. FEMA camps, I was saying, my friends. In an interview with Mondoise Pierce, who served in the 349th Psychological Operations Company and the 205th Infantry Brigade and as a senior NCO, then as Judge Advocate General until 2012, said, well, let's say we don't ramp up a war with Russia and we do get a more, more active anti-war movement, says a Donald Trump, says a, say a Donald Trump who's already let everybody know he thinks of the Constitution or Hillary Clinton and Obama has said he can kill American citizens. The military goes to them and says, hey, these dissenters are going to cause us to lose a war like the Vietnam War. Let's put them in military detention. Let's impose censorship. Everything's in place right now. Something like Abraham Lincoln did, you know, during the so-called war between the Civil War, which is the war, I call it the war, the war against the Confederacy of America. And I will, I will continue on here. Pierce is a self-professed former neoconservative until the Gulf War began opening his eyes to the folly of U.S. imperialism. And then he personally witnessed how government began using 9-11 to assume totalitarian control in the name of fighting the tactic of terrorism. He now works as a Gautamo defense attorney. We have a total surveillance of the, of the U.S. population through the NSA. That's what these huge data storage facilities are about. We store all the data that, we, that they've gathered. They've gone to the public and say, we're not to listen to your phone. We're not listening to your phone calls. What they are doing is storing it. Ha ha, see? It is all there, just like a huge data file, like the Stasi. They would go at their file on someone and go use that against them. Well, they have all the, that collected data, includes, including people's attitudes. So if the day comes, which, pe which if people like Vermelu and Ponzer have said, we may have to impose censorship and have military detention. And 1966 all over again, right? Pierce's fears were further confirmed when West Point began hiring constitutional law attorneys who openly professed that we are going to have to start putting law professors into military detention and take other legal measures because they are subverting our will to fight. Other professors at Harvard University Chicago were saying it is time to visit the writings of Carl Schmitt, who wrote actively to justify the Nazis and cement their power in Germany, and spoke on the need for dictatorship in 1922. The professors even wrote their book about centralized authority called The Executive Unbound. Section 1021 of the 2012 Defense National Defense Authorization, Authorization Act was perhaps the crowning achievement of the totalitarian U.S., which removed the right of habeas corpus during this never-ending war on terror, meaning that the United American citizens suspected as belligerents can be subject to military law and indefinite detention. This is not only the only possible fate that awaits American citizens should major war break out and government essentially becomes a military junta. Junta, I think it, yeah, Junta, excuse me on that, but you know what? You could thank your Lord and Savior, teleprompter reading stooge, President Barack Obama, the other puppet to the New World Order. He signed that into law on New Year's Eve 2011, and people said, I'm going to miss him. Yeah, he's saying, he's saying that. How about we say, hey, we miss Adolf Hitler, or Fidel Castro, or Joseph Stalin, or Mao Tse-Sung, or George W. Bush. You go, how dare you? Practice what you preach. Don't be a hypocrite. I'm going to continue on here. Pierce explains how he was in the court when the Obama administration argued that, ha that they have the power to kill American citizens as part of a sweeping authoritarianism granted onto itself to take any means necessary in the war on terror. Obama demonstrated his, this power in 2011 by assassinating Anwar al-Awlaki, an American citizen in Yemen, in Yemen, and then his 16-year-old son for good measure. Pierce is not alone in his in his well-informed 
deep concerns for proto-fascist trajectory of the U.S. government. He is part of the veteran intelligence groups that include four NSA, NSA whistleblowers who were all arrested by the FBI gunpoint but were able to avoid prison by turning the tables and showing that the government was making things up. We are more we are more sophisticated form of what I think has to be called fascism. The term fascism was applied to the way the communists and Stalin got on as well. You bring the term fascist to what it really means, and it ultimately is ultra ultra militarism and authoritarianism combined with the ex expansionist foreign policy, and that's us what you can say you can see it, us becoming the fascist path is being subtly applied at home but it's already the guiding principle of foreign policy doctrine is now in place that says the u.s can kill and kill any non-us person who deems to be the enemy and that this is already being carried out targeted drone strikes in numerous countries where no war has been declared one of the people unnamed colleague this I uh, this I did uh, ooh, I disagree with most is very with most is very supportive of what we have we've been doing but he sort of slipped one time and said the military commissions act it's almost like we are exercising martial law over the whole world we are we are taking those presidents from our own martial law period over over our own territory and applying it to the world. Someone who may be anti-drone and warfare in Afghanistan or Pakistan is guilty of a war crime and is, gets targeted with a drone strike. So we are doing to the Middle East and other parts what the Germans did to Europe in World War II. They held that any anti-German opinion was basically a war crime and putting aside the Jewish issue, but non-Jewish people who might be opposed to the Nazis' invasion before the Germans invaded, they were put into a military detention. That's the problem with the idea that you're at war because you adapt the most extreme understanding of who the enemy is and then justify killing them or putting them in military detention because they're the enemy. As Pierce notes, when you wage a totalitarian foreign policy like that it eventually spills over and more into your domestic system and we're seeing this in section 1021 essential to this creeping fascism is the state's mastery of propaganda while sustaining the illusion that democracy is a meaningful protection against government abuse of power after the anti-war movement ended the vietnam war the military machine ramped up its efforts to control the narrative building on call tell pro to identify and neutralize subversive elements at the same time it looked for ways to glorify the military such as the department of defense defense department's collaboration with hollywood on the movie top gun and the effusion of militarism with american football bingo and i've seen top gun so i can say that fascism founding principle is how to manipulate the masses so propaganda was always central to fascism to alternative democracy allows for the form of democracy but it requires a fascist principle that all people must be driven to the same ideas and of course militaristic and authoritarian because you can't have this dis 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 dissenters in a fascist state or not too strong of a dissident movement as pierce notes american generals would have bankrupt the country pushing their crusade in vietnam had it not been for the anti-war movement he said that we have now face a situation like communist Russia which bankrupt itself through a perpetual war or Nazi Germany's failure in Stalingrad which caused Germans to reconsider their ongoing conquest of Europe the only thing that are more subtle for the United States will just slowly erode our economy and again we're doing it already but we can conceal it said Pierce in Nazi Germany the White Rose anti-war dissenters managed to have significant influence before and after their execution, helping those to expose the atrocities Germany was carrying out in Europe and contributing to the end of Nazi reign. Today, the U.S. government does not need to execute dissenters. It can simply make them disappear through indefinite military detention using a vast surveillance empire while the war on terror goes on endlessly. 
if, the, if those people who see what's wrong, what have to but that that have to try and change the dominant narrative to the one truth to what is truth truthfully taking place said Pierce no more than ever we must expose the truth of US foreign policy the fascist violent political machine machine machinations that are bringing the country to a brink of collapse and the world to a brink of war absolutely and um and I've been, I remember, I talk about a couple times, the book by Jim Keith called Black Helicopters of America, and um, him and what his team did, they found out basic, um, you know, areas where the, where the camps were, and so, and now if you um, go to, let's go to FEMA, go to like FEMA's uh, campsites, there's a lot of areas, like I said, or substations and so forth, and many of them are around in Mexico, California, New York, Texas. They just want to, like, use this all for humanitarian purposes. They're going to try to sell you something, which is not. So, and that's why I've been saying this for years, for the past 15 years, the war on terror, the war with ourselves, or conflagration with the, with the people, with this people, whether it's the United States or the world. That's the war, the war on terror is against the war on humanity. That's how I see it. So everyone's got to really pay attention. That's what I'm saying. I do see a big awakening happening. Even though many of them are Trump supporters, but they see something is wrong, and I commend that. And even some of these third parties, they see something that's wrong. Doesn't mean I'm going to agree with everything what they say, but they look. We have, well, we got to look at the bigger picture. We have to focus on the bigger ad, ad, enemy. All right, and it's not just the United States government as a whole, but the criminal elements within this within that particular institution. They are just an example. I know the foreign bank cartels behind it. We can go on. We can say you can say whatever you want, but it's all part of the one world order plan, and the United States is just a muscle for them. That's how you got. That's how I look at it. I despise an empire. I know I've been saying this multiple times on my past shows, but at least you know one thing: I'm pretty damn consistent. So everyone out there needs to share this. And spread the word. It's called the truth. And it's happening. It could be done. Even with the whole NDAA. Thing, like There's some towns and some counties are, are saying we're not going to nullify it. That's got to be pushed on a local and state level. And uh, just hit the 10th Amendment Center on that. And they'll give you all the information. I'm not going to add a footnote. So just look it up yourselves. You won't be disappointed. You'd be surprised what you can do. Okay, next one here. Everyone talking about the out, um, power outage on the East Coast, internet outage. And it's from Wired.com. So let's hear what we know about Friday's massive East Coast internet outage. It's by Lily Hay Newman. It says here, Friday morning is a prime time for some casual news reading, tweeting, and, internet, and general internet browsing. But you may have had some trouble accessing your usual sites and services this morning and throughout the day. From Spotify and Reddit to the New York Times and even good old wire.com for that you can thank it is this the ooh, distributed denial a service attack department of the DDOS that took down a big chunk of the internet for most of the eastern board this morning attack started around 7 a.m. eastern and was aimed at DYN, a um, DIN, a internet infrastructure head company headquartered in New Hampshire. That first bout was resolved after about two hours. A second attack began just before noon. DIN reported a third wave of attacks a little after 4 p.m. Eastern. In all cases, traffic to DIN's internet directory servers throughout the U.S., primarily on the East Coast, but later on the opposite end of the country as well, was stopped by a flood a malicious request from tens of millions of IP addresses disrupting the system. Late in the day, Din described the events as a very sophisticated and complex attack. Still ongoing, the situation is the indefinite reminder of the fragility of the web and the power of the forces that aim to disrupt it. So, as I say, every high gadget, tech gadget has a flaw. 
okay ripping up the telephone book dins offers domain name system dns services essentially acting as an address book for the internet din is a system that revolves the web web addresses that we see every day like wire.com and into the ip addresses needed to contact need to find a connect with a right server so browsers can deliver requests co request a content like like the like the story you're reading right now the ddos attack overwhelms a dns server with lookup requests rendering incapable of completing any that what makes an, a, an attack so in, so effective rather than targeting individual sites an attacker can leave out the entire internet for any end user whose DNS, DNS requests root through a given server. DNS registrars typically provide, provide authoritative DNS services for tens of thousands, tens, for thousands or tens of thousands of domain names. So if there is a service impacting event, the collateral damage footprint can be very large, says Ronald Dubbins, a principal engineer at Arbor Networks, a security firm that specializes in DDoS attacks. DDoS is particularly effective type of attack on DNS services because in addition to overwhelming servers with malicious traffic, those same servers also have the same have to deal with atomic re-requests and even well just meanings users hitting refresh over and over to summon up an uncooperative page as dns absorbs more and more attacks the scale of the situation becomes more clear specifically that it's really really big there is nothing really new about this type of ddos attack we've seen them for at least three three last three years they tend to be difficult to stop says matthew prince the ceo of the internet infrastructure company cloudflare but dyn would see them on a regular basis we see them on a regular basis the fact is that it's causing D din so many problems it's pretty good evidence that it's an extremely large attack prince adds that cloudflare 2 has seen to uptick in errors on its own network it is not under attack it's just experiencing a fallout from the din disruption indeed access to dozens of sites and services have been disrupted by the attack users in the same regions like asia seem to experience fewer problems than those in the u.s though the topo topology of the internet does not directly correspond to physical geography it does approximate it, it to a degree says dubbins since then says the impact was on its east coast servers this probably create a localized effect this attack highlights how critical dns is to maintain is ma to maintaining a stable and secure internet presence and what the ddos mitigation processes businesses have in place are just as relevant to their dns service as to the web servers and data service centers richard muse a vice president of technology at the enterprise security firm ns ns focus writes in an email what the bonnet botnet the overall picture is still somewhat hazy, but information has become available as the day has progressed. Initial reports indicate that the attack was part of the genre of DDoS that infects Internet of Things devices. Think, think webcams, DVRs, routers, etc., etc., all over the world with malware. Once affected, those Internet connected devices become part of the Bonet army driving malicious traffic target toward a given target excuse me the source code for one of these types of bonnets called myra was recently released to the public leading to speculation that more myra based ddos attacks might crop up din said on friday evening that the security firms flashpoint and cloud services provider akami detected myra bots driving much but not necessarily all of the traffic in the attacks similarly dale drew the chief security officer of internet backbone company level three said the his company sees evidence of further involvement there's also a potential motive to use my my right hack against din or at least at certain 
irony in it. The company's principal data analyst, Chris Baker, wrote about these types of low key based attacks just yesterday in a blog post titled, What is the Impact on Managed GNS Operators? It appears he has his answer. And all that and all that DNS services and the customers should uh, be on notice. Exactly. So the whole thing, like I said, you, you have to expect these. And, um, and like I said, the internet start is created by human beings. You got to expect the flaws. This is how it is. But one thing for sure, try not to take it for granted. Try to keep everything clean. Te- make sure you test all test all your test all your goodies. Make sure you got a good anti malware program or software in your computer because it is essential into your servers and all that as well. But um you can't blame the Russians for this, right? Of course, of course, you know Hillary Clinton you know, feels, oh yeah, it's the Russians' fault. No, it's not. I'm not gonna buy that. As long as you have, as long as you have something to really back it up, not not buy your lip services. So um, definitely, folks, just be just be vigilant, even through the internet. Never leave all your eggs in one basket, okay, my friends. That's all I need to say about it, okay. Enough said. I know I repeat those words a few times. All right, finally, this one came from. LouRockwell.com and um, says here the establishment's in panic. This is by Patrick J. Buchanan, which people say was a very controversial person, but but his writings are really good. I would say to be honest. And this is, let's see what he has to say about this. Pressed by moderator Chris Wallace as to whether he would accept defeat should Hillary Clinton win the election. Donald Trump reply: I will tell you at the time. I will keep you in suspense. That's horrifying, says, says Clinton. Setting off. Okay, I will tell you at the time. I will keep you in suspense. Okay. That's horrifying, said Clinton. So, so um, so, sorry about that. I, I, I compound them all. So, sorry about that. Setting off a chain reaction on post-debate panels with talking heads falling all over one another and purple face anger, outrage, and disbelief. Disqualifying was the cry on Clinton Cable. Trump won't say if he will accept election results, wailed the New York Times. Trump won't vow to honor results, ran a banner in the Washington Post. But what do these chatter class, chattering classes and establishment bulletin boards think the Donald is going to do if he falls short of 270 electoral votes? Leads a led a coaxy uh, coaxy's army on Washington and burned it down as the British general Robert Ross did in uh, on August 1814, while little Jimmy Madison fled on horseback out of out of the back Brookville Road. What explains the hysteria of the establishment? In a word, fear. The establishment is horrified at the Donald's defiance, because deep within its soul, it fears. That the people for whom Trump speaks no longer accepts its political legitimacy or moral authority. It may rule and run the country and may rig the system through mass immigration and a mammoth welfare state so that the middle America is never again able to elect one of its own. But that establishment, disconnected from the people it rules, senses rightly that is unloved and even detested. Having Fixed the furniture, the establishment finds half of the country looking upon it with the same sullen contempt that our founding fathers came to look upon the overlord's parliament sent to to rule them. The establishment panic is traceable, is another fear, is ideology, is political religion, is seen by growing millions as a golden calf, a 20th century god that has failed. Trump is taking down our democracy said a shocked Clinton after having expunged Christianity from our public life and public square our establishment installed democracy as a new deity at whose altars we should all worship and our so our schools began to teach half a millennia ago missionaries and explorers set sail from Spain England and France to bring Christianity to the new world today Clinton's Obama's and Bush's send soldiers and secularist tutors to establish democracy and among the lesser breeds without the law. Unfortunately, the natives, once democratized, returns to their roots and vote for Hezbollah, Hamas, and the Muslim Brotherhood, 
using democratic processes and procedures to reestablish the true God. And Allah is no Democrat. By suggesting he might not accept the results of a rigged election, Trump is committing an unpanderable sin. But this new cult, this devotion to a, to a new holy trinity of diversity, democracy, and equality is of recent vintage and has shallow roots. For none of these, diversity, equality, democracy, is to be found in the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the Federalist Papers, or the Pledge of Allegiance. In the pledge, we are a republic. When Ben Franklin, emerging from the Philadelphia Convention, was asked by a woman what kind of government they had created, he answered, a republic if you can keep it. Among many in the silent majority, Clinton democracy is not an improvement upon the old republic. It is the corruption of it. Consider six months ago, Virginia Governor Terry McAlfee, the Clinton blunder, announced that by executive action, he will convert 200,000 convicted felons into eligible voters by November. If that is democracy, many will say to hell with it. And the felons decide to look to electoral votes of Virginia, and Virginia decides who is our next U.S. president. We are obligated to honor that election. In 1824, General Andrew Jackson ran first in popular and electoral votes, but a, but short of majority, the matter went to the House. There, Speaker Henry Clay and John Quincy Adams delivered the presidency to Adams, and Adams made Clay Secretary of State putting him in the path to the presidency that had been taken by Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, and Adams himself. Were Jackson's people wrong to regard as a corrupt bargain the deal that robbed the general of the presidency? The establishment also recoiled in horror from Milwaukee Sheriff Dave, Dave Clark's declaration that is now torches and pitchforks time. Yet, yeah. Some of us can always recall another time when Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas wrote Points of Rebellion. We must realize that today's establishment is a new George III. Whatever it will continue to adhere, adhere to his tactics, we don't know. If it does, to re the redress honored in tradition is also revolution. Baby boomers, radicals loved it. Raising their fists in defiance of Richard Nixon and Spiro Agnew. But now that the populist nationalist right that is moving beyond the, the nice ties of liberal democracy to save America that they love, enlist enthusiasm for revolution seem more constrained. What goes around comes around. That's right. If you, if you screw around with the people a period of time, it will backfire. And that's why it's interesting about the 2016 election. Like I said before, he's not talking to a man who's a Trump supporter. But the biggest mistake those idiots did, they all went after Trump. It's a witch hunt. That's all he did. Big mistake. Things are happening. And that's why we got the 10th Amendment too, to revolt. Like I said, Pat Buchanan, when it comes to his writings, I, I like it. I really do. I have to agree with him and everything, but he's really good at what he does. And this is the new King George and the bank cartel and all that. They are worried. Because things are happening. Look what happened with Brexit. They told him to stick it. And we could tell these bastards to stick it too. Like I said before, I may have digressed periodically or harp it. They need us more we need them. There's one thing I like. What Jefferson said the best, a little rebellion now and then is good. And we can do it many methods now, thanks to technology, including the internet. That is all it, my friends. I'd like to thank everyone for listening. Plus, feel free to download and share this throughout your social media networks. That includes the rest of my archives you find on Spreaker. If you have any questions, comments, or send me something that's interesting, whatever you do, please set, deliver your correspondences with Decorum. You can hit me on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, Spreaker, iHeartRadio, Tumblr, YouTube, 
Freedoms Network and Scene.life. Furthermore, if you want to email me, you can contact me at LokiLuck3, which is all together, LokiLuck, what's the number three, at gmail.com. Yeah, I just decided to do a song, another song. And it's by a band from Atlanta, Georgia called Mother's Finest. They've been around. I think they're still around. I'm not so sure, but they still do jams and mostly real popular in Europe. But they influence a lot of groups, even from the Atlanta, Georgia area, if I'm correct. And this this one came out in '92, uh, and this was entitled Generator from their album. What's the name of their album? Black Radio won't play this record. <laughs> But they're really entertaining. They got a lot of energy and drive. And uh, like I said, they have evolved too. But they do a lot of funk. But this one here is more rocking. And like I said, people I know people have seen them. So they're one of the most energetic, talented bands they witnessed. So I'm going to play a song from them called Generator. That came out from there, of course. All right. Once again, thank you for your time. Plus, always remember that demoniac resistance is healthy for the soul and can liberate humanity. Until next time, take care of yourselves. Keep on spreading the love and may your guardian spirits be with you. (laughs) 